just learning how to have relationships, intimate relationships, intimacy, not sexual intimacy. I mean, intimacy meaning just below the surface. So having real connections with people, men and with women, that's part of the recovery program. That's part of early recovery. And learning how to do that is super important if you want to be happy, joyous, and free, as opposed to relying on a relationship to feel better. Hello, my friend, and welcome to another episode of I Love Being Sober, sponsored by Camelback Recovery, Arizona's preferred sober living option to help AA newcomers stay sober during their first year in the program. If that's you or someone you know, then you're in the right place because my name is Tim Westbrook and I'm the CEO and founder of Camelback Recovery here in the always sunny and always sober Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I over the course of many years have helped thousands of people to stop their suffering and continue on their path to recovery. Let's get clear on one thing. We believe that a relapse or a slip is not a part of recovery. And that's exactly why this podcast is dedicated to you or any loved one you know in their first year of striving to live a clean and sober life. The purpose of this podcast is to come clean with all of the misinformation that's out there about recovery, addiction treatment, mental illness, and the strategies to stay sober in general. So if you believe you're in the right place, or if you know someone who is struggling with addiction, it's my privilege to share this podcast with you. Now, I have no idea if you and I have ever met, but what I do know is that AA saved my life. And I also know that to find long-term recovery and live happy, joyous, and free, it is not just about stopping your drinking, drugging, gambling, sexual indiscretions, or any other addiction you may have struggled with or suffered from. Because at Camelback Recovery, We believe that sobriety can and should be fun. And look, any recovery process is not easy. It is challenging. It can sometimes be annoying. And for the most of us, it is often difficult to stay on the path. But here's the good news. The self-awareness you gain from listening to this podcast, especially if you are in your first year of recovery, will help you make better choices, which will ultimately lead you to living a kick-ass sober life. Visit camelbackrecovery.com to learn more about our treatment strategies for alcoholism, drug addiction, or mental illness. And we even offer recovery coaching so that you can enjoy the freedom and happiness you've always searched for. Welcome to the 77th episode of I Love Being Sober, the show devoted to people in their first year of sobriety. If you are pressed for time, listen at 1.5 times speed and you will still get all of the content from this episode. No need to take notes because I paid a professional note taker to do that for you. The notes to this and other episodes are available when you look for them at ilovebeingsober.com. Please do that when you're done listening to this episode. You'll be glad you did. And that's my personal pledge to you for listening in its entirety. Now, although your first year in sobriety is central to our discussions, you and I will also explore other fascinating and important topics such as health and fitness, self-care, food and nutrition, breathwork and biohacking just to name a few. All of these things are your gateway to living a kick-ass sober life, which is our mantra at Camelback Recovery. In episode number 77, you'll learn the five mistakes that lead to a relapse. Learning these five mistakes along with how to avoid them is critical to avoiding a relapse. You'll discover the five mistakes people make that lead to a relapse, along with why it is so important to avoid these mistakes if you want to avoid a slip. So lean in and listen carefully because this episode could have a significant impact on how you can make it to a year and much closer to living a kick-ass sober life. Also, this podcast is like an AA meeting in that everyone here is either clean and sober, struggling, thinking about getting clean and sober, or whatever it may be. So if you learn anything or if you hear anything that resonates with you throughout this episode, please let us know in the comment section of YouTube or Apple or wherever you're listening. What you share might resonate with someone else and possibly save them from a relapse or maybe even save their life. Every review and every comment gets us that much closer to helping one more person or one more family. So don't be shy and be sure to share what resonates with you in the comment section. 
There are five key mistakes that lead to a relapse that you must be aware of if you want to avoid a slip and stay on your path to recovery. Mistake number one, trying to stay clean and sober on your own. Your best thinking got you where you are today. You cannot do this on your own. You must seek help. The opposite of addiction is human connection. Isolating and trying to figure out how to stay clean and sober on your own, it just won't work. White knuckling it, it won't work. I've seen many people try to get clean and sober on their own. And hey, I was one of them. I mean, I remember the first time I attempted to get clean and sober, and I wasn't even really trying to get clean and sober. I remember I went to go see a therapist. Her name was Jean Collins. And I remember my now ex-wife, Jennifer, we went to go see this therapist. And I thought we were going for marriage counseling. Next thing you know, we're sitting there with Jean Collins, who's the therapist, and my then wife, Jennifer, and we start talking about my drinking. And I'm like, well, I don't understand why we're talking about my drinking. I just like to drink. I'm not an alcoholic. I just like to drink. And I remember Jean said, well, okay, if you don't think you have a problem, then why don't you stop for 90 days? And I said, okay, no problem. So I stopped for 90 days. And she said, you might even want to check out an AA meeting. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) I don't need an AA meeting. I'm not that bad. It's no problem. I can stop for 90 days. And I remember during that 90 days, I didn't go to meetings. I didn't connect with anybody. I didn't talk to anybody about my drinking and my drug use. And I just white knuckled it. And I was able to do it for 90 days. And the restless, irritable, discontentness feeling is a real thing. And I remember that feeling. And I actually ended up taking pills during that period of time. I didn't even realize it until after the fact. I realized I somehow got a hold of pills during that period of time because I said I wouldn't drink and I didn't drink, but I could only white knuckle it for so long. I've seen people white knuckle it for years and it's not fun. It's no way to live. Trying to stay clean and sober on your own, white knuckling it, it's really, really hard to do. It's not fun. And getting clean and sober is fun. It actually has to be fun. If you want to achieve long-term recovery, it's got to be fun. And you must go out there and talk to people and connect with people and build relationships with people that are in recovery. That's the only way to really achieve long-term recovery. Short-term, you can do it on your own short-term. You can white-knuckle it in the short-term. Long-term, not going to work. Mistake number two, expecting instantaneous results. You are setting yourself up for failure if you expect your life to dramatically change too quickly. And you drank and used for a long time. Most likely you drank and used for many, many years. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, maybe half of your life, maybe more than half of your life. And during that period of time, I would venture to say, that you were lying, cheating, and stealing. That's what we do, alcoholics and drug addicts. We lie, we cheat, we steal because we're chasing fulfillment is really what we're doing. And during that period of time, while we're lying, cheating, and stealing, we're causing wreckage. So lying, cheating, and stealing, you were causing wreckage for a long, long time. It's gonna take you some time before your life turns around. And what I'm referring to are your relationships, your family, money, your job, you caused a lot of wreckage. And I've seen people, they think that, hey, I'm clean and sober now. I should get everything back. My parents should love me. My parents should forgive me. My loved ones should forgive me. My friends should forgive me. I know I owe all this money, but hey, don't they see I'm sober now? Guess what? Yes, you're sober now, but it's just the beginning. It's gonna take you some time to clean up the wreckage It's going to take some time for people to see that you're living your life differently. You're doing things differently. You're a different person. It's going to take some time before you become a different person. Remember, you're programmed to live life a certain way and you're programmed to react a certain way. And 95% of your thoughts today were the same thoughts as you had yesterday. And 95% of your thinking is subconscious. You're just, the way you live your life is a certain way. It's going to take you some time to live life differently. It's going to take you some time to clean up the wreckage. People are going to need to see the new you for a while before they start to trust you. Some people quicker than others. 
but it's gonna take you some time. That's the main thing. So don't accept instantaneous results. Mistake number three, not finishing the steps. Completing the steps is the foundation for your recovery. And not finishing the steps means that the foundation to which your recovery is built is not complete. And hey, the 12 steps, that's what worked for me. So whatever recovery program it is, do it from start to finish. Finish the entire thing. Going in and just starting a program of recovery, whether it's Smart Recovery, Celebrate Recovery, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Sex Addiction Anonymous, whatever it is, you got to do the deal all the way through and you got to do your digging. You got to do some digging. You've got to figure out what's underneath it. You got to find the trauma that's underneath the pain. Dr. Gabor Mate says, the question is not why the addiction. The question is why the pain? The pain is the cause of the addiction. The addiction is the solution. The addiction is what makes you feel better. So finishing the steps, finishing your recovery program, following through, you've got to make sure that you do that. Now, if you're doing the 12 steps, for example, I've seen many, many people. I've sponsored many, many men. They do the first step, the first three steps, and then they're out. The first three steps are easy. And Anybody can do the first three steps. People do the first three steps. They start to feel better. They admit that they're powerless over alcohol. They're powerless over drugs. They're powerless over people, places, and things. They're powerless over Facebook, sex, whatever it may be. They come to believe that a power greater than themselves, so whether it's God or the universe or whatever it is, can restore them to sanity and then made a decision to turn their will and their life over to the care of God or a higher power or somebody else. And those first three steps are powerful. And for me, because I used to think that Tim was in control. If it's going to happen, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to play hard. And it was up to me. And I'll tell you what, believing that I'm in control of everything that happens in the world, in my life, is crazy. What that caused was stress, anxiety, overwhelm. And guess what? Things never worked out exactly the way that I thought they were going to work out. So turning things over to a power greater than myself, which I call God, hey, guess what? I don't need to be stressed out because everything is happening the way it's supposed to work out. And God's in control and Tim's not in control. So whatever your program is, you've got to follow through with it. But the first three steps are powerful, but the real work begins at step four if you're doing the 12 steps. And so many times people, they get some relief after doing the first three steps, and then they don't want to do the real work. And then they think, hey, my life is better. I'm just going to continue. And that never, ever, ever, ever works out. And in Alcoholics Anonymous or any other 12-step program, one of the main reasons people relapse is because they don't finish the steps. I've seen it so many times, which as a sponsor, sponsoring men, I see it. I'm the owner of Camelback Recovery. So I see clients that they start working a 12-step program, we're 12-step based, and they don't finish the steps and they go back to their life and they get a few things back. They get a relationship back and they get their parents back. They get their wife back. They get their husband back. They get their job back. Then the recovery program is out the door. That never works. They always relapse. I see people pick and choose which steps they want to complete. I see people that want to skip straight to step nine. They do the first couple of steps and then they want to start making the amends. They want to start making amends to people. They want to start apologizing. They want to start admitting that they were wrong. And oh my gosh, it was wrong of me to do this. Will you please forgive me? And then people aren't necessarily ready to forgive yet because you were such an asshole for so long. You stole, you lied, you cheated. And one of my clients, he was a sex addict and I was his sober companion. And I remember, and this is a guy that was, his whole situation was a big deal. It was in the news. It was all over the place. And I remember, so this guy had cheated on his wife hundreds of times. And I remember he said, and this was like a week after the whole blow up and she left him and so forth. And he didn't understand why she couldn't just love him. Like, I just want her to love me. I just want her to forgive me. I'm doing everything right now. It's like, dude, you barely admitted what you did was wrong like a week ago and you've been doing it for many, many years, decades. And so 
It's going to take some time. So skipping straight to step nine is you've got to go through the steps one step at a time. Take the advice of your sponsor and the living amends is part of step nine. So before you make your step nine amends, you've got to start living a different life. So people, whether it's your friends, your employer, your loved ones, your significant other, they need to see that you're living your life differently. So they see a different you. They see a different person. And then when you make your nine-step amends, you've already started taking action. So then you make your ninth-step amends, and then it really hits home. Then it really means something. And then after making your ninth-step amends, there's step 10, 11, 12. And the living amends is part of step nine. And when you get to step nine, your sponsor can take you through that. But the living amends, meaning you're living according to your values and you never, ever revert back to that old behavior. So you must have a sponsor. Don't self-sponsor. You must have a sponsor, somebody else that is taking you through the steps. A sponsor is also known as an interpreter. This interpreter takes you through the steps and leads you through the steps and tells you what to do. And I know, for example, Tim, I need somebody else to tell me what to do because many times I think I'm smart. I think I know it all. And alcoholics and drug addicts are smart. We're smart. We are really smart. We're really driven. We can rationalize anything. But if Tim's talking to Tim, if I'm talking to myself, I can rationalize anything. I know that I need somebody outside of me that's leading me guiding me and giving me direction, giving me instructions and telling me what to do. Mistake number four, getting into a relationship. Okay, this is a big one. This is the most challenging thing you've likely ever done in your life. Your focus must be on your recovery. Learning how to live life differently must be your focus. And that means you're developing new lifestyle habits, new eating habits, new sleeping habits, new exercise habits. You pray and meditate. You get some people that you look up to. You surround yourself with people that are conducive to your recovery. You're surrounding yourself with people that are living the life that you want. Your focus shouldn't be on a new relationship. If your focus is on a new relationship, then your focus shifts from working on your recovery to that relationship. Next thing you know, that new relationship is the solution. So when you're feeling triggered, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling depressed, when you're feeling whatever... You have this relationship and the relationship is going to bring you back up and make you feel good. And that's fake. It's not even real. You must learn how to process your feelings. It's an inside job and you must work on your insides so that you can become the person that you want to be so that you start attracting the person that you want to attract in your life. You attract who you are. You attract what you are. And the person that you are right now today is not going to be the person that you want to be with in a year from today, for example. So once you've been sober for a while, once you've worked on yourself for a while, you're going to transform. And once you transform and once you become a different person, you're going to attract a different person. And I can speak to myself that I remember I didn't date for my very first year in the program. I worked through the steps. I focused on myself. I learned how to have relationships with men and with women that were not romantic relationships. And I mean, hey, I used to think that anytime if a girl gave me a little bit of attention or if a woman gave me a little bit of attention, I would think that she totally liked me, which is not the truth. But I learned that, hey, people can be friendly and it doesn't mean that they necessarily want to be with me romantically. And so just learning how to have relationships, intimate relationships, intimacy, not sexual intimacy. I mean, intimacy meaning just below the surface. So having real connections with people, men and with women, that's part of the recovery program. That's part of early recovery. And learning how to do that is super important if you want to be happy, joyous, and free, as opposed to relying on a relationship to feel better, relying on sex to feel better. Because really what that is, is another form of a high. So you're replacing your drugs and alcohol with the high of a relationship. So if and when you have relationship struggles, if you're focused on a relationship in your first year before you're really ready, that could easily lead to relapse. 
which is one of the triggers I mentioned in episode 72. The recommendation is not to date for a year. That's what I did. And I've seen many, many people do it. I didn't date for my first year. It's the best thing I ever did. And it's something that I recommend to everybody that's getting clean and sober for the first time. Focus on your recovery. The other thing that leads to 13th stepping. 13th step means that you date somebody that's within their first year. So if you're in your first year and somebody that has more than a year is attempting to date you or get with you or whatever you want to call it, that's called 13th stepping. So 13th stepping is something that is not advised, needless to say. Mistake number five, hanging out with friends you drank and used with. As they say, if you hang out at the barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. Your old friends who are still drinking and using are not going to support your new lifestyle. Even if they say they are in support, they live life a certain way and their behaviors do not support sobriety. No matter how dead set you are on staying clean and sober, if you are hanging out with people that are still using, people that are still drinking, people that are still living that old lifestyle, there will eventually be a time when your self-will is not strong enough to keep you away from a drink or a drug and you're going to slip. I remember I visited some friends that were in San Francisco, my friend Mike and Sepp and Cameron, and I was about a year sober. I was solid in my recovery. I was about a year sober, maybe a little less than a year sober. I was solid in my recovery and I hung out with my friends. These are my old friends and they're not They were kind of in their 30s and they were still partying a little bit. They weren't alcoholics and drug addicts, but they definitely drank and used more than I guess a normal person would, which today my definition of a normal person is different than it used to be because these guys, they were drinking, they were doing cocaine, they were up all night, they wanted to go to strip clubs. Just their behavior was so not in line with my behavior today. So I look back and I'm like, wow, I can't even believe those are the things that I thought were acceptable. So I was hanging out with them. I was in San Francisco and they were doing what they do. And of course, they were totally in support of my abstinence. And they knew that I had a problem because I was always the one that was the most wasted, the most blacked out. And I was the disaster when I was drinking and using with these guys. So I went out there with them. They were doing what they do. Even though they supported my abstinence, they were still drinking and doing drugs. So luckily, I was solid and I wasn't tempted. I didn't drink. I mean, I actually ended up being the designated driver. Point being, if I was with them at a time when I was not solid, maybe a time when I was feeling stressed out, anxious, depressed, or just whatever, I could have easily slipped Now, luckily, I did not surround myself with them or people that were still drinking and using in early sobriety. And I don't surround myself with people like that today either, because that's just not the type of lifestyle that I live. My life looks much different. But spending time with people that are still drinking and using is not conducive to recovery. And so if you do end up with some old friends, that are still drinking and using, you got to make sure that you're talking to your sponsor, you're talking to your friends in recovery, you're doing everything you can do to prepare yourself. And then if you can just observe and notice, and then after you can reflect, I mean, I know for me, that was a big eye opener for me. It was a way for me to reflect. It's like, wow, that's not what I want my life to look like. And if I had spent too much time with those guys, the story may have ended differently. So. Here's a quick review about the insights you and I both rediscovered in this 77th episode of I Love Being Sober. I gave an overview of the five mistakes that newcomers make that lead to a relapse, along with why avoiding these mistakes is imperative if you want to avoid a relapse. If you want to learn how to avoid these five mistakes so that you can supercharge your sobriety and give yourself the best chance of making it to a year, Come back for the next episode of I Love Being Sober. And remember, these insights will only work for you if you work them. So please be sure you apply what you've learned in this episode of I Love Being Sober. Because if you do, you will be on your way to living a kick-ass sober life. I think you'll agree that's exciting to think about. And speaking of reviews, before we end this episode, I want you to go to the review section on iTunes or leave a comment in YouTube and type in one thing that resonated with you. 
Every comment counts and what you share could resonate with someone else that is struggling and potentially save their life. You will also be asked to rate this episode. I hope I've earned five stars from you. So go ahead and share the one thing that resonated with you in the review section of iTunes or wherever you are listening. It'll take just three minutes out of your day, but what you share could not only save you, but it could also save someone's life. Okay, that does it for this week. I'm Tim Westbrook, and I hope that our paths cross again next week for I Love Being Sober, the show devoted to people in their first year of sobriety. Sound like a plan? And do whatever it takes to join me for episode number 78, because we are going to dig into mistake number one, trying to stay clean and sober on your own. I will share my experience with this mistake along with how to avoid it. I encourage you to invite a friend, a loved one, or a sponsee to listen to I Love Being Sober. I can't wait to connect with you then. It will be an insightful episode. So I really want you to join us with your loved one. 